But national health care isn't socialism any more than Medicare is. It's just a practical and efficient way of providing medical treatment for everyone in the country. The same way the interstate highway systems are practical and efficient way of providing roads for everyone in the country. Sort of an interesting analogy. But from surveys, this is not a popular approach. More than two-thirds of those interviewed in a survey conducted by SMC business councils indicated desire to not have a government-run insurance plan. Many undoubtedly were concerned about another bureaucratic organization being involved in their health care. However, over half believe the national single-payer system is inevitable. Another CBS New York Times survey reported 64% of Americans said the government should guarantee health insurance for all. Universal coverage is another alternative, but it's essentially it's the same concept. It basically says that health care should be available to all people and not impacted by the availability of insurance or the ability to pay. It's more of a philosophy or a concept and would generally rely on something like the single-payer system uh, for the uninsured. Something critics point out that affects universal coverage is the lack of primary care doctors to provide this coverage. In the previously mentioned Commonwealth survey, only half of American adults were able to see a doctor the same day they became sick or the following day. Many doctors are now uh, not accepting new patients, and with coverage for all, this would become a breaking point. Only about 20% of graduates in internal medicine are going into primary care, and this is down from 50% in 1998. While on administrative concepts, I would want to think, bring one other into perspective. That is proliferation of individual state plans. Numerous states have implemented plans, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, Oregon, Vermont, and others. Additionally, California and Illinois are debating plans as we speak. Can you think about the problems associated with having multiple business locations and dealing with the various plans? Or the competition on an impact on demographics as people look to one state to another to see where they can get the best plans? Whatever we end up with should be transportable, and that can only happen, in my opinion, with a national plan. And finally, no discussion is complete without some comment about the insurance companies. Approximately 10% of people covered today are covered by private insurance, insurance they buy with their own after-tax dollars. Insurance is a highly regulated business, with every state having different regulations and mandates. A policy you have in New York may not be available in New Mexico. Most insurance companies are for-profit companies, meaning that they not only have to pay for health care provided to their clients and related overhead costs, but also generate a profit. This means premiums paid are going to be substantially higher than those paid by companies who may be self-insured or have a group insurance policy approach. As a result, private insurance premiums have risen more rapidly than the cost of health care. Since 2001, the Kaiser Family Foundation reports policy prices have increased 78% to $12,106 today, obviously unaffordable for lower and middle income families. Many health insurance companies are now involved in administering plans that employers finance themselves and in Medicare Advantage plans or Medicare prescription drug plans. If insurance companies are to play a role in health care for all, they must be free to compete on a national basis, and the policyholders must be able to deduct their premiums, i.e., a level playing field for people covered by, not covered by company plans. Just in case uh, you do not know, we are not the first generation to work on a national health care plan. The first was on November 19th pretty close to today's date, in 1945, when President Truman, in a special address to Congress, publicly endorsed a national health care plan. But the concept of government responsibility for health care for its citizens goes back even further to 1854, 
when President Pierce vetoed a national mental health bill on the basis that it would be unconstitutional to regard uh, personal health as anything but a private matter in which the government should not become involved. And the last time we tried this was in 1993. It was already mentioned this morning. And that plan, in top-down driven, encountered the perfect storm. Businesses were opposed to it. The insurance industry was opposed to it. The uh, Republicans were opposed to it. The Democrats were divided. And with all those forces added together, the possibility of passing any kind of meaningful legislation was, uh, was unlikely. So hopefully this summary will help you digest some of the issues our other uh, noted guests will be discussing today and also help you formulate your own questions for the excellent panels that we've assembled. As I said at the start, there are no easy answers, just intelligent choices. This is going to take bipartisan congressional leadership and a bipartisan spirit at the White House to get meaningful health care reform. Leaders must put aside their bias and work to solve a problem that is approaching the crisis stage in our country. And obviously, business leaders must be at the table as well, since they currently provide so much of the health care Am Americans currently receive. I have one closing quote, the source I could not find, but I think it applies. And I quote, a future of hope for and opportunity requires that all of our citizens have affordable health care. When it comes to health care, government has an obligation to care for the elderly, the disabled, and poor children, and we will meet those responsibilities. And in all we do, we must remember that the best health care decisions are made not by government and insurance companies, but by patients and their doctors. Thank you. You're watching the Illinois Channel, an independent nonprofit corporation formed to provide gavel to gavel coverage of Illinois state government and other public affairs events taking place across Illinois. If you have any comments or questions on our programming, please email us at illinoischannel at aol.com. Or if you have any questions about the Illinois Channel, please visit our website at www.illinoischannel.org.